Now that we have defined adiabatic processes, we can now fully examine heat engines. These are devices that exchange heat for work. The schematic for heat engines typically have a high temperature and a low temperature reservoir, which are both connected to an engine. You can continue to imagine this engine is a movable, frictionless piston that allows PV work to be done by or to the gas. The figure as drawn shows heat moving from the high temperature source to the engine to produce work. Some of the heat also goes to the cold temperature source. This is the intuitive direction for heat to flow. Alternatively, however, all the arrows can be reversed so that work is put into the engine and it can draw heat from the cold temperature source and transfer it to the hot temperature source. A common example of a heat engine performing work is how steam is used to spin a turbine and produce electricity. The heat source that creates steam includes coal, natural gas, and nuclear reactors. They all follow the same basic principle. Water is heated to form high pressure steam. The steam then expands into a turbine to spin it and produce electricity. The steam is then condensed in a heat exchanger and pumped back into the boiler. The high temperature reservoir is in the boiler that produces the steam. The work output is the electricity generated by the turbine, and the cold reservoir is the condenser that transfers heat away from the spent steam to the cold reservoir. As was stated previously, heat engines can be used in reverse to draw heat from the cool reservoir and transfer it to the hot temperature source using work. Refrigerators and air conditioners use this principle. For example, in a refrigerator, the compressor pressurizes the coolant and pushes it to coils outside of the refrigerator. When this hot gas, heated from the compression, meets the air outside the refrigerator, it cools and liquefies. Now recall that adiabatic expansions cools the substance. This property is used to dramatically cool the coolant by expanding it into the refrigerator. This transfers heat from the interior to the coolant. The coolant turns back into a gas, and it flows back to the compressor for the cycle to restart. The work inputted occurs at the compressor, and heat is transferred from the cooler interior to the exterior of the refrigerator. Air conditioners work on a similar principle, only heat is transferred from air inside a structure to the outside. Let's now look at one idealized heat engine cycle, which represents the maximum efficiency possible for any classical heat engine. It is called the Carnot cycle, and it is a process with four steps. The first is a reversible isothermal expansion of the piston. The second is a reversible adiabatic expansion of the piston. These two steps represent the work done by the gas. Notice that the adiabatic expansion cools the gas. And the final two steps are a reversible isothermal compression of the gas, and finally a reversible adiabatic compression of the gas. The fact that the compressions occur at lower temperatures means that the work put into the cycle is less than the work extracted from the cycle. The difference between the expansion and compression work is the area enclosed. The area enclosed by the four paths therefore represent the total work performed by the process. Let's now determine the work that's done for each step for the Carnot cycle, and then we'll use that basically to calculate the total work produced. Now the thing that we're going to do is we're going to be calculating the work done in the four steps, and I'm just uh, numbering these four steps where, again, we have the first isothermal expansion, we have the first adiabatic expansion, then we have an isothermal compression, and then finally we have an adiabatic compression that leads us right back to the beginning point, which is this point right here, P1, V1, T hot. And through this, we have this region that's basically enclosed by the four lines, and that region is going to end up being the work that's generated by this cycle. And so then by calculating what is the area under each of these curves, we can then add that up. And what we'll end up in the end is the total work of the Carnot cycle. So starting with the first step, this is an isothermal expansion. And so the work that's performed by an isothermal expansion is simply just going to be equal to the integral of V1 to V2, since we've got V1 here and V2 over here. And that's going to be the integral of minus p external times dv. And of course, I can write, since we're looking at reversible processes, then this can be minus nRt over v times dv. And since t is constant, and I know t is constant because this is an isothermal expansion, and so then that means that all of these variables nRt 
those can just come straight out front. I get the integral of dv over v. So we know the answer to this is going to be minus nRT natural logarithm of v2 over v1. I also know that the t in this case, this is just going to be t hot. And I know that's t hot because I have an isothermal process where I have t hot and t hot here. So the temperature, like I said before, is constant. I'm just denoting it explicitly here in the expression. For the second step, which is this adiabatic step that I have, well, in that case, I'm going to calculate the work just like we outlined in this lecture, where I know that the work is going to be equal to the change in internal energy, since, again, this is an adiabatic step, which is just going to be the integral from T hot to T cold of N times the heat capacity, the the molar heat capacity at constant volume times dt. And so again, I have two constants, the number of moles and the heat capacity. And so those come straight up front. And so I'm just basically taking the integral of dt. And in the end, what I get is a work that's equal to the number of moles times the molar heat capacity at constant volume times t cold minus t hot. All right, so that takes care of the expansions. Now let's do the compressions. The first compression happens here, this is step three. This is an isothermal uh, compression. This is done at T cold, and it runs between uh, P3 and V3 and P4 and V4. And so again, I can just write this as, since it's an isothermal expand or compression, then the work is just going to be equal to the integral from v V3 to V4 of minus P external dV. I can make the same substitution. I can make p external equal to nRT over v. Since t is constant, then I can then put it all out front. This is now t cold, integral of v3 to v4 dv over v. And again, I get a work that's equal to nRT cold, natural logarithm of v4 over v3. Finally, we have step four. Step four is an adiabatic process and it runs from P4 V4 to P1 V1, so we end up back at the beginning. The step four, since it's an adiabatic process, then we know the work performed is the same as the internal energy, which I can calculate by saying the integral from T cold to T hot of the number of moles times the molar heat capacity at constant volume times dt, and I get an exact same answer that I had down here before. The only difference is that I'm just going to have to reverse T hot and T cold because T hot is now the final state, T cold is now the initial state. So now if I want to find what the total work of the cycle is, I just need to add up these four expressions for work for these four parts of the cycle. And the reason why I can just add them up is that some of them are going to be minuses, some of them are going to be pluses, so their sign will determine if I'm going to add and subtract, and that, that sign comes from essentially the sign convention that we've been using this whole time. If the system does work on the surroundings, it's negative. If the system has work performed on it by the surroundings, then it's a positive. But when I'm adding this up, I can just say, well, work total is equal to work one plus work from step two plus work from step three plus work from step four. 